And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're always crying out about what is the will of God and, and what are we, you know, what are we going to do in this situation? And if we are offering ourselves as a living sacrifice unto Him, then our very lifestyle will prove what is that perfect and acceptable will of God. And we're going to look at these first two verses very uh, in-depthly, and then we'll st take a step back and we'll walk through the rest of the chapter and see what that looks like for us. By the mercies of God is His compassion towards us. From the depths of His very heart, He cries out for humanity to be transformed. That we wouldn't look like the world, that we would be called out from them, we wouldn't act like them, and we wouldn't make decisions in the same manner that we see the world. And we're going to see later what that looks like. What are we supposed to do when, when people harm us? Or how are we supposed to act even for, for leadership and ministry? Do we take on that selfishness and do we make things the way we want it? Do we conform our very worlds the way we want it conformed? And not looking at what God wants. Not giving Him the place and the first and, and prominent position in our life to say, okay, this is what I want. But what do you want? And I know that that has, that has freed up my prayer life with, with God. When I can cry out and say, you know what? In all reality, this is what I want. This is what I want to happen in this very situation. But I need what you want more than what I want. And being freed to do that, it lays out my expectations. And it allows Him to examine them. And then feed back what's necessary, what's beneficial, and what's good. He wants us to present our bodies, to bring forth, to commend, to give your entire physical being over to something. And this is over to Him. And how awesome it is that this very phrase was actually used for slaves. That slave owners would be able to present their slaves to a task on their behalf. I know many times in the Civil War, if a man couldn't fight, he would bring one of his slaves to fight in his stead. And this is that same type of situation where we are supposed to make our bodies our slave. We are supposed to make this flesh do, act and perform the way that God wants it to perform. Not what we want. Feeding ourselves the, the things that we believe are going to bring us comfort that actually end up dividing us from the people we love, from the people around us, the, separating us from a life of success and honoring God. This is not what we are called for. We are to embody ourselves with the very will of God. That it would be, that our bodies would be our slave and then we would present that to Him as a sacrifice, something that is offered to Him, that He would be able to do what He wants with us. And this is our flesh absolutely surrendered to the holy call of Christ. A living sacrifice, this is, to me, it's, we, we spoke about this in Sunday school very briefly, about why do people not believe in the urgency of Jesus Christ and the urgency of, of our necessities to, to surrender to Him. And the reply was, well, because people love their deeds. They love how they're living. They love what they're doing and how true it is. Because what this is asking us to do is to take that life that we think we need to live and give it to Him before it's wore out. But many times, I know in my youth, well, I'll surrender to God after I've lived my life. After I've done all these things, then I'll give Him what's left. But that's not what He's called us for. That's not what He desires. A living sacrifice. That which is already alive and still has life and still has vibrancy. Give it to Him. Let Him do what He wants with it. I know many times when we think about surrendering to God, our minds immediately go to everything we're no longer going to be able to do. Well, if I surrender to God, then I'm not going to be able to go out and do these things. I'm not going to have to give this up and I'll have to give that up. 
That is not the life that God has called us. That's not the point. That's the enemy whispering in our ear and trying to justify and convince us not to surrender to Him. There is absolute freedom in surrender. You can't have a victory without surrender. And it is our duty to surrender to Him. Become His slave that we can enjoy freedom. You've never had joy in life until you have been surrendered to Him and seen His joy come upon you and how your life will turn and He'll change situations. He'll change how you see the world and in that moment, the world will change. And it's no longer us trying to scrimp and scrape and, and try to, to make things the way we want them. But He will change our view of the world and that world will change and we'll no longer see the dark and the abysmal and all the destruction. But we'll see His hand and we'll see His light. We'll see His love. We'll see opportunities for us to work. There's no greater joy than to be aligned with Him. That we could be holy and pleasing to Him. This is pure Morally blameless. When we walk according to our own conscience that God has given us. He said, I will take their heart of stone. I will give them a heart of flesh. A soft and pliable heart that's not hardened by destruction. That's not hardened by bitterness. And I will write my word on their hearts. The very tablets of our hearts. That is when our conscience is quickened and made alive and joined with His Spirit. That we now fully know right from wrong. And we, we know that when we harm people or when we do things that bring dishonor to ourselves and to our family and to Him, we know within our very being that it's wrong. Many times before we even begin to, to make that mistake, our heart starts pounding. And we know within our very core that what we're about to do is wrong and it's going to destroy us. Now many times we fall to it. And there's that grace and that mercy and that love of God on the back end to help us get back up and do it right the next time. But that alive and quickening that we can be presented to Him pure and morally blameless. Acceptable by the very God of creation. Accepted. And that's our cry. That's the crave of everyone's heart is to be socially accepted. Everyone has that desire. But we'll never feel accepted until we surrender to Him and receive His acceptance. And fully believe that we are accepted as the beloved, as a child of God, believing fully in His acceptance for us. Not, on who we, not based on what we do but based on who we are as His creation. There's been many times in my life where after I've, after I've fell and been ridden with guilt and I've cried out to Him that He would change me. Change me. Change me. Why am I this man? Change me. And so, so often I hear, I made you just how you are. We're going to change what you do. But I love you. And we're going to keep pushing on. And it's a difference between who I am and what I do. And oftentimes that line is blurred and we think that we are the very acts that we portray and that we commit. And it's not so. God created us and our personalities and our very beings are pleasing to Him. Our personalities is exactly what He made us to be. But through walking through this world and through falling and through the sin and destruction and torment of this world, our original creation of who we are has been distorted in our desire to protect ourselves from the harm of the world. And that's what He wants to clean up and that's what He wants to shape. That we can walk confidently in this world. Know that we are accepted as a child of God. That we carry His love in us and we honor His love for us. And in this we are pleasing. And it says that it is our reasonable service. This is a logical and divine worship. 
This is a decision that has to be made based on the facts that are presented before us. It's not an emotional decision. It's not a decision, oh, I, I feel the guilt of my sin and I want to go and throw myself on the altar and then we get up and there's no life change. There's a momentary change. There's a zeal that we have and a passion that we have for God, but it's not grounded in knowledge. And therefore, it doesn't last. This is talking about a conscience decision that we make to follow Him. To lay ourselves prostrate on the altar, just as, as Isaac did when his father was called to sacrifice him. We are all called in the same manner. You know, Abraham and Isaac, they say that... that Many times we want to believe that Isaac was a young man. He was 12, 13, 14. But as the timeline shows us, he was in his late 20s and early 30s when he crawled on the altar. What a love and what a trust for his father that he had to have had. It wasn't naive. It was a conscience and logical decision that he made to honor his father, to obey him, and to lay on that altar. And to stay still when he's seen that knife from his father raise up. This is a logical decision that he made. To become a willing sacrifice. Trusting his father. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to, to sit in that same place as Isaac did. To be willing to lay ourselves down. You know what? There's a lot of things that I want for my life. There's a lot of things that I want for my children. There's a lot of things that I want for their future. That's what I would consider my life. But if I don't take all of those things that I want and I don't lay them down on an altar before God and allow Him to sort through it, to remove what is harmful, what's not beneficial, and to replace it with the things that He claims and He determines that are good and beneficial. That is laying down my life, laying down my wants and my needs before Him and allowing Him to make that decision. Allowing Him to have that preeminent, that important position in my life. And I have to lay those things down. That is me being a willing sacrifice. Now am I a willing sacrifice all the time? In my estimation, probably not. But it's a process that we go through. I admit, I jump off the altar all the time and I try to run. I don't know if you've ever seen my son try to take off away from us, but a lot of times I think that's what I do with God. Where it's time where God want, reaches down from my hand like I do with Him and try to lead Him somewhere and He takes off. He doesn't go anywhere. He just runs around in a circle. And I think that sometimes that's me. Sometimes I'm the one running around the altar. God is so patient and loving and kind and waiting for me to exhaust all my remedies so that I have nothing left but Him. And then I'm willing... That is long-suffering to be, to be in that place and knowing, you know, as God looks at us and He knows that we're running nowhere, but allowing us to run out of steam and allowing us to exhaust our remedies, that we would willingly open our arms and follow Him. That is long-suffering. That is patience at its finest. That is love. You know, he, he's the commander of the universe. He could, he could snap his fingers and pop us to attention and make us do everything that we're supposed to do. But there'd be no love and there'd be no relationship. And it is that loving relationship as a father that should motivate us to trust him and to lay ourselves at that altar and to lay our lives down as a willing sacrifice to him. The way that we do this is to not be conformed to this world. Don't fashion and mold ourselves into the image of our age and our culture. Many churches, we have created a culture inside of the church that has time-stamped services, that has laid out dress codes, that has laid out behavior patterns. 
And it's a culture. And we can choose to mold into that just as adapted as, as a, a child is when they go to school. They may have a preference of clothes they like to wear, but when they get to school and they see how the culture is dressing, then they're more apt to come home and then put on those clothes that would make them acceptable in that environment. And we've done that. As Christians, we've done that. We've surrendered many of our principles on the, on the altar of social acceptance. Well, I'm not gonna, I don't need to seek God for this situation because I see how this church does it. Or I see how this group of people does it. So that must be the way we're supposed to do it. And it's not so. You know, even in child raising, you know, the, our culture today is, is empower the child. Give them the opportunity to think their way through situations. You're not allowed to discipline them and you're not allowed to, to do these things. Our culture put parameters around every angle and every place in our life. Do we follow that? Do we, do we eat that and believe it and say, well, that must be how it is? We're never supposed to discipline our child and we're supposed to reason with them and allow them to think their way through situations? Look at our, look at our kids under that culture. Look at our kids and look at the destructive lifestyles that they've created. Because left to our own, we're deceitful and wicked above all things. But that's the culture. So do we conform to that? Let it not be so. But it's like that in all of our lives. There may be things that are, that are of little or no significance to you, but you have decided, well, I'm going to do it this way because that's how they did it. Or that's how I've always done it. And the whole time, God is trying to get you to do something new. He's trying to get you to be fashioned and formed like Him. There may be just some old behaviors that don't amount to nothing. Maybe it's just a TV program that you like to watch or, or whatever it is and that you did before you came to Christ and you, you are still in it. And it's not destructive. It's not, it's not overtly wrong. But He may be calling you to give Him that time. Give that to Him. And do we maintain that old fashion of that old man and walk as we used to walk? So I know I had some, some very laid out and specific designs for my problem solving skills before I surrendered to Christ. I had a set line of ways that I solved my problems. And none of them were good. None of them were acceptable. None of them were beneficial to anyone. So I could maintain that fashion and when I'm faced today with hardships, and I'm faced today with that, with that persecuting situations, situations that perplex me and stress me out, I have a choice. I can reach into that old man and I can maintain that fashion and form and how I used to solve my problems and create yet another wake of destruction. Or I can walk in a renewed mind, believing in God and taking on His solutions and taking on His actions. And walking through it. Am I perfect with it all the time? Absolutely not. More often than not, I'm coming back behind and apologizing for things that I do and things that I say. But He's working on us. It's not a, it's not a perfection. It's a journey. He's not looking for our perfection, but He is looking for our progress. That we are progressing it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a metamorphosis, is where this word comes from. The caterpillar to the butterfly. I love this analogy because in my heart, if I see a little caterpillar, it's real easy to squash them. I have very little problem stepping on a, on a caterpillar or kicking them. To, right? Cruel and heartless, I know. But when I see a butterfly, I'm not so apt to, to harm the butterfly to end its life. I'm more apt to help it 
where it won't be destructive, where it won't be destroyed. I think God is like that with us. That before Him, we were like that caterpillar, just inching along, slow as can be. But through Him, we change and we become this beautiful butterfly that is seen by the world as an object of beauty and something to be desired. And that is that renewed mind that He wants. That is that transformation that He wants to take us into. But in order for us to become and to truly change into that new image, there's some construction that has to happen. This next set is, is the renewing of your mind. This is a complete renovation of your mind, will, and emotions. Complete renovation. I don't know if anyone has ever went through the process of renovating a home and making it the way that you want it made. Maybe it a, a, has a nice structure, but the inside isn't really uh, workable. So you would go through the home and you would determine the load-bearing walls, either the walls that hold up the structure. And those were the only things that would remain. And everything else will be removed. So it will be an open building, an open square with pillars. And in our new life, those pillars are our principles in Christ. It is our grace and our mercy, our salvation, our character, are established and built by these load-bearing pillars in our lives. Our preferences and our personalities form the walls and square rooms off. This is my devotion room or this is my... Right? And that's how God rebuilds us into a home that He is willing to inhabit and to take up residency. And it, He wants to tear out all the junk in our lives and all the dead space in our hearts that He can build a dwelling place for Him. That will be a life that is holy and acceptable unto Him and worthy of Him. That we would be pure and morally blameless. We need to understand that our feelings are not facts. They're not based on fact. They're based on our perception of the events in front of us. How we believe creates how we feel. And we act upon those feelings. Many times in our culture today, people say, Oh, well, I felt like this, so I did it. Or I feel depressed, so I must be. Or I don't feel good about myself. I feel like I'm a bad person, so I must be a bad person. Or I'm feeling really good today, so I must be a really good person. I don't know how many of you have ever been on a roller coaster of your emotions where one day you're a good person and the next day you're a bad person and the next day you're okay and the next day you're not. A roller coaster of emotions. And that is because we are putting more faith into our emotions and how we feel about the things around us than taking control of those emotions and determining, reframing how we view ourselves, how we view the world. And how we view ourselves in the world. And we must reframe our world. That's what God wants us to do by renewing our minds. We are reframing the way we think about the world, the way we think about us, and again, the way we think about us in the world. And we have to go through this reframing. We have to reestablish who we're going to be. Because we have to make a decision. And we have to draw a line that says, I'm going to be this guy. This is who I am. This is who I want to be. And I'm going to walk in the character of my God. And in that time, when we begin to, to reframe our world, then our life will prove. It will test and examine what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God then our life will prove what God sees as beneficial, acceptable, 
And in perfection, it is a complete growth of character. That He is building our character. He is making us trustworthy. He is making us honorable. He's making us gracious and kind and generous. This is His perfection. It's our character that He is attempting to perfect. That we can be fully mature and grown. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about the love of God and what a man is like without it. What God is in love. And it, it ends with, when I was a child. I spoke as a child. I reasoned as a child. And I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And that is the process that God is bringing us through. To perfection. Perfecting our character. And making us and forming us in the fashion of His Son. This is what's happening inside of us as we go through this process with Him, as we go on this journey. This is what's happening. These first two verses, by His ultimate compassion for us, He is making us that willing sacrifice by renewing our minds and transforming us into His likeness and removing the likeness of the world and of this age and of this culture. That we could be formed and fashioned for Him and with Him. The application of what that looks like are the next several verses. I'm going to read through them. But my hope and my desire is that you seek them throughout the week. And you look at them and see where your behavior is not lining up with the application of this process. In verse 3 it says, For I say, through the mercy given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to our portion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, and he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorts on exhortation, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity, he that rules with diligence, he that shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. Without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kind and affectionate to one another. With brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope and patient in tribulation. Continuing. Instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless them with cur which curse you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, be, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil, and provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And the command of the end is, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the test and the proof and the examination that we need in our lives. We need to go through that itemized list. And I want you to see that the very beginning of it, it speaks to those who are in leadership in ministry. If you have any gift in you, 
This is how you're supposed to operate. This is supposed to how, how you utilize it. And I promise you that every single one of us under this roof and every child of God is given a gift that He is to administer to the body. Now there is a maturing process that comes before that gift will make room for itself and stand you up to offer it to the body of Christ. But you be assured that there is a gift in you that God wants to use. In proportion, without hypocrisy, in all sincerity and truth. And if we are not seeking that, that stage of maturity where we can come out and offer that gift to the body of the Lord, then we are stale, stagnant, and self-centered. And seeking nothing but our own. There's two sides. One man says, I have these great gifts. Get out of my way and let me show you. And another man says, oh, I don't have anything to give. I'm just going to stay over here. And we might think that the, first, that, the, that the second one is humble. But I assure you that that's not humility. That is just a reverse of selfishness. It is an inverted selfishness where he's still making the whole world about him where the other is doing the same thing only he's just out with it and we see both throughout the body of Christ and God has promised that the gifts that he put in you will make room for themselves when you come to a point of maturity all the doors will open and God will make sure whether you like it or not that you are set in that place where that gift that He put in you can be offered to the body. I know with me in my life, I know that, that He is cultivating these things in me and, and young in my life, I was full of zeal. I didn't have the knowledge it took to be consistent. So everywhere I went, I tried to force myself into utilizing these gifts. And oftentimes it was never received with grace and mercy. And it wasn't until I came to a point in my life where I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to seek God and I just wanted to do right by Him in all sincerity that then the doors began to open and opportunities for God to utilize the gift that He set in me began to open for themselves and left me helpless but to obey. And it's the same way. He operates the same way with every single one of us. When it is time, when that appointed time comes for you to operate in that gift, then nothing will be able to stand in your way. Not even you. And it goes through and tells us how that process of maturity should be. What it should look like. That we are to love one another. That we're, we're to be generous and kind and gracious. To be a blessing. To be willing to be all things to all men that some might come to Christ. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. It's not about us. It becomes about them. And we set our things aside because God is renewing us. And we're to step out and to help those who are in the same process. And it comes down to our very core. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and curse not. That when people do harmful things to us, and when, when the opportunity for resentment comes, we are to bless them. And not to curse them. Not to lower ourselves to that same action that's being done to us. Vengeance and wrath is unto God. And He says He will repay. And I've tried to repay. I've tried to be my own God and exact my own revenge. And I still feel empty when it's over. It's never fulfilling. And the guilt and the remorse that is, is followed along in those footsteps are never worth that initial emotional reaction. It's never worth it. And there's not been a time where I haven't come out broken 
over my behavior and broken over my choices to be fashioned into my own character, to take on my own vengeance. God gives us a promise in verse 20. He says that in so doing, when we love those who hate us and we bless those who persecute us, He says then it opens Him up to exact His revenge on them. And it says it's like heaping coal of fire on their head. That He'll deal with them more harshly than we could ever imagine. And it should bring us to a point where we don't want that for them. Our love and our capacity for compassion runs deeper than our own desires for them to suffer. When we realize that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And when one of us are harmed and one of us are hurt, he said he is, it is more willing that that man should have a millstone, a huge rock tied around his neck and thrown into the sea than to offend one of us. That's pretty powerful. That we would, we would rather, as an enemy of God, die a drowning death than to suffer the wrath of God. And this should bring compassion to us. It should bring pity to us. To want to help them. And to want to see God bring His salvation and His love into their life. So whenever they come with us in the full force of, of, of their harm and, and their anger and resentment and vile, it should break our hearts for their condition in the world. That they're separated from a living God and they don't even know what, what they're doing. They don't know the destruction that awaits them and the torment that awaits them. Instead of saying, well, how, do you, how dare you do that to me? And we make their suffering about us. And it's not about us at all. It's about their condition and their relationship with God and the torment and suffering that awaits them if they don't fall to their knees and surrender to a loving God. And our last command is be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. And this brings back a place of simplicity for me because when I want to do something that I know is destructive, that I know is displeasing to God, I need to get up from that moment and go do something that is good and beneficial for someone else. And we have a promise and a guarantee that that will shake off the dust of that desire and move us into a place that is acceptable and pleasing to our God to our Father. We need to not repay evil for evil. We need to overcome the evil that comes at us, even if it comes from within us. To overcome it with what is good and beneficial. Find something, whatever it may be, that you can turn to and go and do. That you don't just sit there and sulk in that driven desire to do your own thing. And God will move. And He will shake those things off of us. And then we can rise and be honorable and pleasing and acceptable to Him. Which is what we desire most of all. It is ultimately what we want. Amen? Amen.